Power Up. Welcome to Energypreneurs, where I bring to you the exciting new opportunities in solar power, battery, and electric cars. I'm your host, Sohel Hasni. I have been tracking and analyzing these technologies on LinkedIn and Twitter for more than 10 years. Thank you, Priyanta, for your time. Good to see you again. Yeah, good to see you too. Uh, so here. Must be feeling really great that finally this policy thing is over, no? Yes, yes. It's a great, uh, it's a great achievement. Uh, you know, of course, it's a great uh, team achievement. I must say, it's I'm, I'm that's only the only the one who uh, you know sit there and represent the whole team, but. It's a big, uh, you know, achievement for the team, and uh, it's it's a it's a big team effort. Yeah. Yeah, I think also one other thing I like this time was uh, 2009 policy did not touch so many people. I think the consultation, both internal and external, was quite minimal. No, this time it's very different. This time is very different. We had, uh, you know, uh, if I can remember the number, forty odd consultations. And uh, with all sorts of different stakeholders, of course, starting from our own uh, board members, uh, shareholders, and then uh, the governments, um, you know, respective governments, then uh, NGOs, uh, CSOs, um, and uh, academics. As you know, in every uh, Asia Clean Energy Forum, we had at least for the last couple of years, we had, you know, consultations on the energy policy. And then experts and uh, all people from from all sorts of different uh, you know areas, we have been consulting on this. And then we came up with the uh, uh, draft. In fact, um, you know, jumping with this team came up with the draft. I I got the final you know <laughs> credit, but then a lot of work done by jumping and then the team. Yeah, I was part of the team anyway. Yeah, um, obviously you are very happy with uh, the final outcome, no? I am. I am quite happy because, um, as uh, you know, uh, Robert uh, Gild, uh, who led the process during the transition and then later on uh, took it to the final line, uh, always used to say that you know it's not an easy task because you have stakeholders pulling it in different ways and bringing something which is finally uh, acceptable to everybody uh, was not an easy task. And uh, we used to say that if we can make everybody little and unhappy, then it's fine. Yeah, yeah it's because a, nobody it's, will be happy. Yeah. yeah, it's a regulated job. You have to be fair. Make sure everyone equally unhappy. <laughs> exactly. 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 Okay, so, now, yeah. what are the things that you think where ADB really made a difference relative to others, uh, our previous what? policies? Yeah. Yeah, I think the biggest difference is we say outright no coal. We mm -hmm. will not support new coal power plants at all. That's uh, loud and clear in the policy. And then any support to coal, uh, existing coal will have to be uh, one thing like uh, accelerated decommissioning, mm -hmm. like what we are going to do now in, through energy transition mechanism, which is going to be launched uh, at COP26 uh, today, in yes. few hours time. I'm sure you have got your link. You can always be part of it and, and listen to it. Um, or uh, any other, I mean, obviously we can have existing coal power plants emitting all sorts of other uh, you know, local, uh, which are not going to be that good uh, for the local environment and, and uh, you know, destroying the local environment. And if you want to control that, for instance, in, <clears throat> in the case of India, we had uh, emission control systems uh, failed in emission control system. We had to, uh, uh, you know, uh, one has to uh, support such uh, interventions. And that can be done provided that uh, the original plant life will not be extended. So we don't want any, uh, you know, extension of uh, life to those uh, power plants in our intervention. So overall, the biggest achievement is biggest, uh, uh, you know, uh, the key in this policy is no coal at any cost. Okay, I mean, uh, yeah, that, that I mean, it was there by default, but yeah. it was never written down. So exactly. this is 
Okay. And then I see also on the gas front, uh, it's also quite specific, no? I mean, yes. Under what yeah, on the gas front, again, uh, I mean, overall, uh, you know, we are, we are trying to move away from fossil fuel financing as much as possible. Mm -hmm. <clears throat> because it's, a, it's important that we recognize the need to move away from fossil fuel financing, or not to move away from fossil fuels in the energy sector as a whole. So that's, that's recognized very much. So, but we also recognize that that cannot be done overnight. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. So coal, we have taken the decision and we have not supported coal since 2013. So that's it. Let's, let's uh, you know, uh, put a full stop to it and declare it. And when it comes to uh, things like gas and oil fired power plants, we wanted to make sure that we support it under specific uh, uh, you know, conditions when there is no other alternative uh, to support uh, those energy services. And uh, that will have to be uh, uh, properly uh, uh, demonstrated in the, in the due diligence process. Once that's done, we will support, not otherwise. Because we have, on, on, on one side, while we recognize the climate uh, uh, impact, uh, climate challenge uh, uh, challenges to be addressed, we also have to recognize our DMC is still trying to get their universal access to uh, you know, uh, electricity and uh, the quality of supply improvement and so on. So that aspect is recognized. So when it comes to that aspect, uh, we will support fossil fuel based power generation only if there is no other alternative which is uh, affordable to these countries. That's how we uh, put it. Yeah. So, yeah, I mean, that uh, lays out the clearly uh, the path, but also I saw in this final version that there was a clause that uh, uh, medium income countries. Uh, you cannot do gas under any circumstances. I think that part has been taken out, right? It's uh, same law applies for all countries. Yes. The reason why that was taken out was, uh, uh, sorry, let me, let me see. This, uh, this was taken out because uh, one thing we did not want to distinguish our support depending on the income level of the countries, because that's a departure from our traditional approach that we are open to any uh, support to any type of country among our DMCs, but we go by the merit of the project rather than uh, the income level. So we did not want to depart from that, that original uh, position. Uh, but of course, there was a lot of pressure for us to include, uh, uh, you know, the exclusion of uh, middle income countries from that possible support in the gas sector. But we thought uh, departure from that original uh, thinking of not distinguishing our support depending on the income level, uh, that was, that was, we have to retain it. So that's why we uh, moved away from that point. But having said that, please keep in mind, Mid, upper middle income countries can always attract private sector investments if needed for natural gas related uh, uh, you know, projects. Now, when, as a matter of fact, we always ask the question first, when it comes to sovereign financing, should we support this? Can't we get private sector? If the private sector cannot come in only, we go in. So in effect, unless it's absolutely necessary, it's very unlikely that we will have uh, sovereign financed uh, or ADB financed natural gas projects in these middle, upper middle income countries in reality. Uh, yeah, and yeah. I, I completely agree. Again, that's the point I had some of my direct clients, uh, Turkmenistan, our in Central West Department, Uzbekistan, uh, to be able to uh, get a seat on the table to discuss what we do. If you are saying, oh, you're a middle income country, I cannot have a seat on the table then you miss out the opportunity to influence, right? Exactly. And, and those income classification was more to uh, make sure uh, concessional finances help those who need, as opposed to doing other policies, right? So this right. country classification. So exactly. now I was very happy with that, even our clients when I was talking to them, because I was quite worried. Uh, we are working on a, not a gas project, doing energy efficiency in a gas project, uh, by from a open cycle to combined cycle, but if it is 
because of the gas power station, there is a risk somebody somewhere will say, no, middle income gas, you cannot proceed. Because carbon has no color, carbon dioxide is the same, right? Doesn't matter where it comes from. Exactly. exactly. Oh, that's very good. Exactly. Exactly. Yeah. Okay, that's uh, fantastic. So on the generation side, it's very clear. And of course, we are uh, quite open on all form of renewable energy. Yes, yes, we are, we are open to all forms of renewable energy. Of course, during consultations, one of the areas we had a tough time uh, was, as you know, um, when it comes to civil society organizations, um, each type of civil society organization, uh, you know, uh, doesn't want us to do certain types of generating systems. Mm -hmm. If you always you have uh, people talking about uh, against geothermal, for instance, mm -hmm. though geothermal is considered to be renewable, and if you do it right, we can get it uh, get get a renewable energy source out. But that was opposed. And then waste to energy is another where we had a long, long discussion. Where we had long, long discussion. We, we of course, uh, you know, when we support this kind of uh, uh, you know technologies, we support under certain conditions. Naturally, waste to energy, we explore uh, the maximum uh, possible uh, way to uh, go for recycling and uh, reuse, mm -hmm. and uh, then incineration comes the last time, naturally, and. Uh, but there were a lot of people opposing uh, even uh, waste to energy. So such, such issues were there during consultations, but we recognize the concerns from these parties. And then we try to obviously incorporate that into project designs, but we did not want to exclude these from the, from the, from the uh, policy. So virtually all the uh, renewable energy uh, sources are uh, part of the policy. And in fact, we will support them. And not only support them, we'll try to bring in concessionary financing wherever it's possible from various uh, uh, sources we have and uh, any capacity building uh, needs of these countries uh, to implement, uh, uh, you know, these renewable energy, all that is embedded. And also any transition they would like to have from fossil fuel based systems to uh, renewable energy systems that also will be uh, supported. Uh, and also it's going to be just transition because naturally some people might lose jobs, might uh, lose uh, their income generating opportunities as a result of uh, this transition. And that also will be uh, very much supported under this policy. Okay, so that's good. So the generation side is quite clear. And uh, we kept the same approach as before that, uh, of course, ADB will not finance nuclear. But other than that, no nuclear, no coal, gas with certain exceptions, and then all renewable. What about large hydro? Large hydro, we again, we have uh, uh, specifically said we will support large hydro again under very specific conditions in the sense uh, we don't have to reiterate that in a way, even in the policy, because those conditions are already embedded in our safeguard policies. Mm -hmm. right? And uh, we have to make sure that they are complying with our so safeguard policies and subject to that we will support uh, large hydro. So uh, large hydro concern is mainly safeguards and that will have to be complied with uh, the safeguard policy statement. And with, uh, you know, subject to that, we will support large hydro because as you know, hydro is one of the uh, sources which will really help get, uh, you know, more and more other types of renewable energies to into, into the system uh, because of the uh, need to have stable operating conditions in the power system. And uh, so climate change challenge needs to be, uh, you know, uh, uh, confronted with such technologies, whether we like it or not. So we'll, we'll support large hydro uh, under certain those conditions. Okay. On the generation side also, <clears throat> I did not see a specific sort of uh, highlight about micro hydro. I know you have been involved in a lot of micro hydro. So uh, do you think that we could have done a little bit more for micro hydro and rooftop solar just to highlight them a bit more, no? We could have. In fact, uh, um, I know some of the uh, later, you know, most of the highlights may have come for wind power, uh, solar and so on in general. But uh, yes, I mean, uh, we could have done it, but, uh, but it does not mean that uh, we are, you know, having second thoughts on any of these technologies. In mm -hmm. fact, 
micro hydro and uh, uh, you know technologies like micro hydro has been there and it's very much accepted it's a very uh, uh, good uh, source renewable energy resource which we have been exploiting we will exploit it continue to support it so that's very much uh, in our hearts though it may not be uh, specifically written in the policy it's the same with solar rooftops and overall solar we have mentioned but um, we may not have specifically uh, singled out uh, solar rooftop but they are very much uh, uh, you know uh, close to our hearts and that that's going to be supported yeah Okay, that's very clear on the generation side. So any of the listeners who are just rather than reading the document can go into more details, obviously, in the document, but obviously yeah. get a good glimpse for from what you just said. Thank you. Now, if you move into, say, transmission side of it, there is no prohibition as such, except you said earlier that if it is a, a fossil fuel generation, that this transmission exclusively will carry, then we need to look at some transition path, no? This is what you said. Yes, exactly. Because, you know, overall, uh, Sohail, we have to understand uh, the investments in transmission particularly, uh, and also distribution uh, is very, very important uh, for the power systems to move forward and power systems to get strengthened and, and, and uh, for universal access and to improve reliability and all sorts of these things, we need to have transmission and distribution network uh, full, very much uh, supported. And uh, you don't have uh, you know uh, so much of investments coming in other than uh, supporting investments or investments from uh, multilateral banks like us uh, to this network uh, you know improvements. And therefore, we need to be in that space whether uh, you know people like it or not. And at the same time, we have to ensure that this uh, network will not support uh, uh, fossil fuel uh, generation systems, because in the in the in the longer run, that's going to be an issue. So we have specifically said, if a transmission line is dedicated to evacuating uh, coal power, we will not support. And that has been anyway the practice again, like uh, you know, since 2013, we have not been supporting any coal power plants. And I don't think we have supported power evacuation lines from any coal power plants at all in recent time. So that is basically uh, putting um, what we have been doing uh, uh, you know, down in writing in the policy uh, this time. So apart from that, there is no restriction uh, of uh, you know, uh, supporting transmission and distribution networks, no. We will continue to support. We will continue to support improving, uh, uh, you know, supply side energy efficiency in that sense because transmission improvement means that. And then uh, universal access uh, to distribution networks will have to be supported. And uh, we will provide other technologies, smart technologies, to make them smarter so that more and more renewable energies can be absorbed, both the transmission network as well as to the distribution network. As we know, you know very well most of the distributed generation will have to be you know, connected to the uh, distribution network. That means uh, strengthening distribution and the flex improving the flexibility of distribution network is very important. So that's very much uh, within the policy and we will support it, yes. Okay, so uh, will the same restriction uh, apply to then gas pipelines within the country? Or how will gas Again, pipelines fit into this? Yeah, it's again on a case by case basis, as I said, uh, it's not only a gas based generation, but also any gas based project will have to go through the screening criteria specified in the policy. I think it's a paragraph 76 or 75 or 76, I can't remember. And uh, so that screening criteria will have to be, uh, uh, you know, satisfied if any project, whether it's a pipeline project or a gas fired power plant project to go through. So it's going to be, uh, in that sense, very much country specific. Mm -hmm. And uh, we have to look at the economics of it and overall impact of such a project uh, within the energy sector uh, in terms of emission uh, reductions. And, uh, and the fact that there is no other alternative. Uh, if there is other alternative, so of course, for a gas pipeline, there may not be an alternative as such, uh, but uh, all that will have to be satisfied, yes. Mm -hmm. And then of course, uh, gas in the regional, cooperation context or any pipeline or a transmission line will have also a little bit different dimension, no? Yes, 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 of course, yeah. Oh, this and, is fantastic. So yeah. for the 
Now coming to the distribution side, I don't think we have any specific restriction or incentive because distribution is so essential, no? Yes. Distribution is a must at the end, you know, without distribution, you can't get any uh, anything delivered to the customer at the end. So as I said, uh, in fact, uh, we uh, will not have any restrictions in that sense. And we encourage uh, more and more investments in the distribution network to, to make them smarter and uh, to upgrade it to accept uh, more and more renewable energy, demand response type of uh, interventions. So distribution network will have to be quite flexible in the future and all that support will have to come and we are ready to support under the new energy policy. And yeah. that's where I think uh, uh, sort of regulation and unbundling comes in as well. How do you sort of, of course, distribution is a natural monopoly. You cannot introduce competition, but you can always do monopoly regulation to make sure access to distribution by third parties and all of those no that will still exactly be yeah it's well within the policy and we that's one one uh, element we have emphasized that the uh, the improvement of governance in the sector and mm -hmm. we will provide all the support to make sure that uh, we have the enabling environment for increasing investments number one uh, to make sure that uh, we have uh, you know we we develop the system as uh, the demand grows and uh, also to make sure that uh, the consumers uh, benefit from it in the sense of with good quality, reliable uh, power supply and at, at affordable costs. And, and uh, so at the same, also we are encouraging cost reflective tariffs and uh, at the end consumer level, of course, while looking after the needy uh, consumers, uh, lifeline tariffs will have, will have to be in place and that will have to be, uh, you know, kind of compensated by the government uh, through their own policies. So all that is uh, as part of improving governance in the sector. That's supported very much supported in the in the in the policy. Yes. Yeah, tariff is a very tricky issue these days because the traditional long-run marginal cost curve that we used to draw that is fundamentally changed. If yes. you take into say zero marginal cost solar or zero marginal cost wind into the factor, right? So it's yeah. a very difficult, I don't know what our theoretical economists are doing as to how do you reconcile what is the long run marginal cost today when the fundamental technology have changed, right? Yeah, exactly, exactly. It's not easy because, you know, we don't have long term planning as such in that sense. Yeah, yeah, yeah. You know, yeah. To, get a long, to get a long run marginal cost, you, don't, you have to have a long term plan. and. Uh, of course, you can always have a long-term plan with uh, major power plants in place, but those plans may not work as they are uh, they are supposed to be, uh, because so, you know solar power plants, solar systems can come within one year, and and they are all uh, you know kind of decentralized, uh, deregulated uh, systems, and therefore whenever you need, you can put up your solar rooftop, for instance, and and that's part of generation, and usually it's must buy. Uh, power plants in the sense they have to operate and they can't be cut off. So it's not easy to get a long run marginal cost through that kind of a uh, generating system uh, or for, the, uh, for that matter power system. So uh, it's quite interesting uh, how we, we look at tariffs in that sense. Um, so that brings us to uh, the need to look at whether we like it or not the standard assets. For instance, I mean, if you put up your solar, solar system, and, and use, uh, you know, rather generate all your electricity needs through, uh, with, with your solar system, but still you have the utility connection uh, running and mm -hmm. somebody will have to come and read the uh, zero uh, units on the meter or negative units on the meter you have to read and um, you have to pay back. And, and so all that stranded cost will have to be compensated. And that's why sometimes probably uh, we have to think of uh, looking at this so-called fixed costs uh, in in uh, in the system, uh, really uh, reflected by the fixed charge in the in the tariff, mm -hmm. which is usually not the case in most of the uh, 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 countries. You know, most of the country this fixed cost. You know, there there is a fixed cost, but it's not really cost reflective fixed cost in that sense. And uh, so that's something which. Uh, uh, everybody has to start looking at with more and more decentralized systems coming into place because the utilities 
will have to be there will have to be there because that is the standby power in a way and that will have to be uh, operated and maintained and that those costs will have to be covered but then the utilities also should carefully plan for that in the sense uh, you know how much money you have to spend on the standby supply to make sure that they they get their supplies whenever they need but it may not be as much investments as they would have spent um, you know, under normal circumstances, I mean, there may be ways and means of uh, controlling demand, demand through demand response and so on and so forth and optimize overall investment. So utilities also should think of their investments in a slightly different way than uh, they used to think in a traditional way. So all that will have to be reflected in the final tariffs. So it's a quite a complicated thing. And I think the, PO, the economists will have to look at it. Yes. Yeah, it's a complicated in so many aspects because uh, before uh, we used to have shallow connection charge or deep connection charge, depending on where you are. Right now, you might just say that I don't want to take a stranded asset risk. You pay for the full connection charge. Then the issue right. comes in affordability. Not everyone can afford the full connection charge, right? And then exactly. one other topic I always liked is sort of this is from my uh, regulation days. Uh, that uh, customer, a utility has an obligation to connect. Does it automatically give a right for a customer to disconnect? Maybe not, right? No. <laughs> because a lot of people That's say, it. I want solar, I want to disconnect, but hang on this, the electricity line on your road was made an had made an assumption you will connect. Do you have exactly. an automatic right to disconnect or you have to pay an exit fee, right? That's true, that's true. This is exactly uh, um, you know, uh, what our thinking is in the sense, uh, the standard asset will have to be paid for some, by somebody. You know? And uh, you know, there is nothing, nothing uh, called a free lunch. And these are all spent on, you know, and uh, so costs, costs will have to be recovered. If not by the consumer, uh, maybe by the government, by the treasury, and the treasury means you and me. <laughs> it's, not, it's not somebody else, you know? Uh, yeah, I agree. I fully agree. I mean, just to give you an example here, we worked out in Sri Lanka. Uh, now I am sitting in Sri Lanka these days working from home. And we worked out uh, recently that uh, when you have solar rooftop, generally the practice here is that you work out a solar system on the roof, uh, roughly to compensate to to your total uh, energy needs. Uh, not too much to push back, but uh, you know, total energy needs. That means zero, zero, uh, you know, overall zero, uh, you know, usage uh, net metering. If you look at right, and then the roughly uh, this kind of a house has to pay roughly about eight to ten thousand rupees a month, mm -hmm. right? And we worked out the fixed charge for for a for a house like this it will have to be four thousand rupees. So in, in other words. Half of your electricity bill will have to, you have to continue to pay half of your electricity bill before the, what you had before the solar rooftop. Otherwise, uh, you, the standard assets uh, will not be recovered. Their, their costs cannot be recovered. So then comes the issue, what happens to these uh, consumers who, who are not uh, able to pay 4,000? Because I think uh, in here, more than 50% of the people may be paying less than 4,000 rupees a month without a solar, solar rooftop. So. Yeah, it's it's a, it's a question you need to really uh, uh, seriously uh, take into consideration when you decide on tariffs. Yeah, that's why when I see very simple statement like "oh, tariff should cost recover full LRMC," I think a lot of people are not thinking those issues through because yeah. uh, we are on a standing on a sifting sh sand. Things are moving, no? And those uh, uh, true blue assumption that hold true for hundreds of years is no longer holding true, right? Exactly, exactly, exactly. Things have changed. Yeah. So I think the, uh, that this is fantastic. And how much do you think this uh, policy is uh, promoting new technology? I saw that I've never seen in, in ADB other documents before pushing clean cooking, right? Mm -hmm. And uh, a few other technologies, but do you think uh, on the uh, demand side of it, we could have highlighted even more energy efficiency equipment and things like that? Yeah, um, just again, coming back, I mean, we may have uh, 
uh, given only few examples and what we are going to support. But overall message we wanted to give was that ADB is there uh, to support new technologies, new uh, business models, new mm -hmm. approaches uh, uh, to make sure that uh, the energy system will gradually uh, decarbonize itself. And, and support uh, the energy needs of uh, these DMCs, the, the populations of these de developing member countries, uh, so that their uh, you know, uh, living standards will go up uh, gradually and the economic development will happen. So that is the overall message. So mm -hmm. we may not have, have given a lot of examples, only a few examples may have been given, but energy efficiency, uh, clean energy is the key. Uh, uh, to move forward. And whatever we do, uh, things like demand side energy efficiency, particularly where we have not done uh, a lot in the past, but we are now trying to concentrate more. And uh, so all that is may not have been uh, very uh, specific uh, in, in terms of technologies, but it's very clear. We will support all these new interventions in terms of, uh, you know, not only, uh, uh, you know, deploying all this technology, but before, deployment in, in mass scale, you may need to pilot some of these latest new, newest technologies and piloting we will support and then uh, mass scale, a large scale deployment will be supported. So that's very much the spirit of the, uh, of the energy policy. Yeah, I mean, one thing I wanted to comment, I just uh, forgot, uh, we are working with Turkmen government on this, on a energy efficiency roadmap. The first thing we are arguing saying can the government ban incandescent light bulb and the halogen light bulb? I was involved with the Philippine government when they proposed first time in 2008, I think immediately after Australia, incandescent light bulb. And then I think UK two weeks back finally banned the halogen light bulb as a COP26 discussion. Now, as you know, in the poor people buy the cheapest equipment and they will buy a incandescent light bulb anytime. And they are the one buying our given hands me down 351 television when you and I using a 20 watt television, right? Mm -hmm. So how do we stop this? Is there any thinking done on that? I... Uh, as far as ADB is concerned, we have been, as I said, we have been supporting energy efficiency related interventions and, and, and obviously part, part of our policy dialogue with some uh, governments in some countries has been to help uh, this kind of energy labeling, uh, uh, regulations related to uh, uh, this inefficient equipment and so on and so forth. But we may not have done a lot, but we have been supporting uh, various countries in this regard. And if you take Sri Lanka, for instance, we have been supporting energy efficiency related investments and, and policy dialogue quite a lot for, for a long, long time uh, uh, here. And we have been doing a lot in, uh, in India. Of course, we did not have to go in. Uh, uh, you know, India itself has been doing a lot of work uh, in terms of uh, energy efficiency related interventions and regulations and so on. Yes, we are uh, quite open uh, to go into most of the other countries too. I mean, Bangladesh, we have been doing some work and we'll continue to do. Uh, so that's very much on the table, actually, as, as you quite rightly said, uh, we really need to uh, bring regulations to uh, stop using these most inefficient, uh, you know, uh, uh, you know, equipment and items like uh, incandescent lamps, for instance. It's, it's sad to see incandescent lamps, halogen lamps still being used around, right? And it's very cheap, for sure, but uh, it's not good for the, uh, for the economies, for these people. And yes, we, we are very much uh, uh, supporting that, uh, those, uh, those efforts uh, through ADB. Yeah, because there's no point going solar when 80% of that is going through an incandescent light bulb. So exactly. Yeah, so exactly. Really One good thing, Sohail, is that uh, over the years, as uh, you know, people like you supporting, for instance, the Philippines and, and many other countries, uh, people themselves have changed their habits. For instance, if you come, if you come to uh, Sri Lanka or if you go to Nepal, you hardly see people buying an incandescent lamp unless it's absolutely necessary, yeah, yeah. you know? Because they have really felt the need to go for this, uh, you know, energy efficient lamps because they see how their monthly bill goes down because of that. And uh, it's it's part of their life, like, you know, and yeah. yeah, uh, yeah. Agree, but uh, uh, the thing that I feel sad is 
think Uzbekistan uh, last year or just pre-COVID, I was quite surprised that everywhere. And I asked the ministry saying, yeah, light is a light. <laughs> so, I mean, yeah. that awareness, uh, because just because you have tons doesn't mean you have to waste, right? Oh, yeah, exactly. Like client to Turkmenistan exactly. now understand, saying, okay, every kilowatt hour you save, you can sell it to five cents to your neighbor. Why you waste yeah. here? Exactly, exactly. Very simple. Exactly. Exactly. Oh, this is very good. I mean, uh, it's quite exciting. So what do you tell a young entrepreneur, say, who wants to do something? Is it worthwhile for them to go through the document and find out the where opportunities are? Obviously, it provide a lot of support, no? Oh, yeah, of course. As I said, for instance, particularly the, the latest, the newest technologies, new thinking you are coming up with, and uh, particularly in my uh, sector group, now I am, as you know, I am now sitting in, uh, you know, a sector group as the chief of the sector group. And uh, that can support, uh, you know, this new thinking, new technologies, new business models, new approaches in one form or the other, uh, depending on the proposal. And we can pilot them in countries. We can uh, go along with sovereign investments, uh, uh, with other investments, and then support as as pilots and uh, through grant financing. So any entrepreneurs with new technologies, we have, uh, you know, technology challenge, uh, uh, you know, uh, challenges, uh, you know, uh, uh, you know, uh, in, in our own, uh, you know, operations where we select some of these newest proposals and then finance them. And, uh, uh, and so we, we support in all, in, in various forms uh, for these uh, new entrepreneurs to come in with uh, energy efficient, cleaner technologies and uh, cleaner approaches uh, to satisfy the needs, energy needs of the populations, yes. So our uh, um, energy sector group uh, will support uh, uh, private clients in a country who wants to private entrepreneurs as well? Yes, actually, uh, recently I signed off yesterday, I suppose, uh, one of the technology providers who, who uh, won a, a technology challenge, uh, mm -hmm. you know, proposal for uh, to provide uh, a central air, efficient central air conditioning system, uh, mm -hmm. a technology, uh, which can uh, ensure uh, that there is no uh, virus transmission. I don't know how it happens. Uh, so with something which can be accommodated, of course, uh, uh, very energy efficient and uh, for uh, this entrepreneur to develop that technology and, and bring it to the marketplace. And so that's supported through this technology challenge. Yes, we, we, we have that uh, opportunity uh, within energy sector group and we provide that support. So Priyanta, do you want to explain maybe for someone listening in as to how the energy sector working group, uh, the group works within ADB, you being the chief of that right yes uh, uh, as of course i don't have to explain to you you know very well somebody who is not uh, you know familiar with the adb system uh, we have energy sector operations in regional departments as you know we have five different regions in adb and uh, we have uh, these regional departments have individual energy sector divisions which work with uh, the countries within those regions and directly with the clients uh, client countries and, and uh, uh, you know, uh, energy sector stakeholders in those countries. And then in uh, the place where I am, energy sector group, uh, what we do, in fact, energy sector group in a way is, is consists of all these people in other uh, regional departments too as part of that group. So I, uh, our group sits there as the advisory group to support these uh, regional departments in terms of bringing in new technologies, new systems, new business, business models, and also bring in any expertise uh, required through our own uh, technical assistance grants and so on to support these regional departments to implement this new thinking in, in, uh, in, uh, in those regions. In fact, we are more or less the interface between uh, the latest of the uh, uh, you know, technologies and systems which needs to be brought into LDB operations. And uh, also we manage some uh, uh, you know, trust funds, which bring grant funding uh, to these new initiatives like what I just explained. And that's what we do. And uh, all our energy colleagues are part of this group in that sense. And, and uh, I just happen to uh, you know, uh, lead that group along with them. Thank you.
So at any time, you know exactly what's happening across the bank. Yeah, I'm supposed to at least. <laughs> I'm supposed to know, yes. Because all yes. project goes through your uh, scrutiny somehow, right? That's right. That's right. We have to ensure that uh, the projects are uh, in line with the energy policy and our strategy 2030 and, uh, and also uh, the priorities at the time. And, and the things like addressing climate change, energy access, uh, and and, and uh, additionality, in fact, we should provide value addition as, as ADB, and we are not just another bank, we are a development bank. So all these will have to be looked into when it comes to project proposals, and we, we look after that part uh, in when it comes to assessing projects and providing support, yes. And now you're saying uh, that group can also support technology providers if, of course, there is a development angle to any of their proposal. Exactly, exactly. We have been doing that for some time. We'll continue to do that uh, with uh, more vigor, yes. And what's the average size of those proposals? How much funding? Uh, I mean, it can be, uh, I can't remember exactly. It can be somewhere in the range of about two, three hundred thousand dollars Yeah, in, okay, in that that's, range. That's yeah. a good to start anything. Yeah. Okay, now I have one, my favorite topics that I forgot earlier. What about electric vehicle? What does this fit into our energy policy? I know we made a little bit comments here and there, but this is quite significant, right? And our transport colleagues looks at road safety side of it. The, the, how will the car fit into the ecosystem in terms of safety, accident proneness, noise level, speed, and all of those, but how it integrates with the grid for its charging, discharging, how efficient it is, what kind of impact it will have the system. That's all electrical side of it, the energy mm. side of it. Mm. So, Yeah, I mean, this is something which we need to seriously look at as we go along. And as you quite rightly said, uh, if you look at uh, IEA, uh, you know, uh, documents, uh, which basically talks of, uh, if you're going for uh, net zero emissions by 2050, you have to have 60% of car sales by 2030, uh, electric vehicle, 2030, I suppose, uh, yep. electric vehicles. So, I mean, you have to accept that. And that means we have to, uh, you know, accommodate our electricity uh, networks uh, to, uh, you know, accommodate the charging stations, accommodate uh, these new electric vehicles, which can uh, draw power at one point and push back power at another point, who knows? And, and uh, all that will have to be accommodated. So uh, ADB energy policy, ADB energy sector operations, we'll have to, uh, uh, you know, uh, take this in seriously into consideration in the operation. We do that. And in fact, we are quite active, uh, you know, in my former region, I'm in, uh, in India, for instance, we have a huge, uh, a lot of support for electric vehicle, uh, you know, uh, system, you know, projects in, in India, particularly uh, in the government vehicle fleet. I think they're trying to convert the government vehicle fleet into electric vehicles and we are supporting charging stations and related infrastructure uh, for that. So this will continue. This, this is one of the uh, you know, major investment areas which we can think of in ADB in the years to come. And uh, because transport infrastructure will gradually move towards electricity. As you know, if you are talking on net zero emissions, uh, you have to have electricity as the core source of uh, end use energy. And uh, that means, uh, you know, electricity uh, uh, networks will have to improve to live up to those expectations. Electric trains, uh, electric cars, and all that will play a major role yeah, in, yeah. Uh, in the times to come, yes. Like electric machineries itself, like we are financing in Kyrgyz Republic an electric dredger because normally when we are doing the project, I realize it will cost almost 200,000 to $300,000 each year on gasoline, the, which the country doesn't have. Whereas you are next to a power station. So we said, okay, why can't we just connect? So then we agreed. So this is what's happening. Now that will potentially save huge amount. And you can raise as much as you want because electricity from a hydropower is literally free. And this is a power company doing its dredging, right? <laughs> Exactly. As exactly. opposed to buying oil, no? Yeah. It's the same in places like Nepal or Bhutan, where you have a lot of hydropower and you import a lot of oil to run your vehicles and for cooking LPG and all that can be stopped. 
if you can develop uh, or use uh, electricity as your induced uh, you know energy source for cooking and for transport and that's what these countries should be doing yeah so do we expect to have some specific policy guidance for electric vehicles later on i mean i know that policy did not cover too much but it highlighted that this will be a priority area yeah uh, i'm not sure whether we will have specific guidelines as such but definitely there will be some uh, uh, some knowledge products developed under this uh, you know later on obviously in collaboration with the transport sector which can be uh, useful when it comes to implementing yes. uh, these projects and then we have uh, good lessons learned, of course, uh, we have been doing this for some time, as, as you know, success and failures on both sides, and we just talked about uh, uh, failures in, in, in certain uh, areas in electric vehicle popularization, and, you know, we learned from that, and, uh, and those can come as, as knowledge products, actually, which will be very useful, and we have to document it, and so that we will not repeat those uh, mistakes, at the same time, we will learn from uh, good lessons, and, uh, and move forward, yeah. I mean, same thing with uh, off-grid electrification. I hope to see huge off-grid coming out of uh, ADB financing soon. Yeah, hopefully, hopefully we will we will gradually, uh, you know, uh, emphasizing more on those things as uh, compared to what we used to do. And uh, so, it, it, you know, my feeling is that as the time comes in the future, we are moving more towards those, uh, you know, interventions than traditional uh, big, uh, you know, centralized systems, yes. Yeah, yeah, because then as you mentioned uh, the, uh, earlier that uh, now the whole sort of psyche is changed, right? Solar, two months, you finish a project. Yeah. I mean, off grid, you come and install 15 minutes, now you have electricity, people are watching television, right? Right. So it was unthinkable exactly. before, right? Yeah, yeah, exactly, exactly. So the lead times are so small, and then uh, you know, and that suits exactly the, to the needs of the people, and uh, so it's easy. So things things change, and the times have changed, and we need to uh, think uh, differently now. How we develop this electricity network, electricity system, power systems. Yeah, and it's also not an issue of stranded asset. Technically, of course, it's a labor intensive yeah. process. You can take all your solar, solar panels from one side and track it to the other side of the country. Exactly, exactly. Possible, so before you could not move a power plant, right? Yeah, exactly, exactly, exactly. Now, Priyanda, very exciting time. Thank you, really appreciate your time. I learned quite a lot. Uh, is there anything else you want to make comments on? No, it's all fine. Thank you very much, Sohail, for this opportunity. It's excellent and it's good to talk to you and uh, talk to your audience. And uh, I'm sure that will help to, uh, you know, get to know what ADB has been doing and will be doing under, under our new energy policy and, and to show that we are leading uh, in, in some ways in, in the new energy policy. Thank you very much. Thank you for joining us this week. If you haven't done so yet, subscribe to our show. Also, leave your comments and review if you enjoyed today's episode. Follow me on LinkedIn and Twitter at SHASNI for updates. That's S-H-A-S-N-I-E. Once again, this has been Energypreneurs connecting you to the innovative opportunities in solar power, batteries, and electric vehicles. Stay tuned.